Words you didn't know, collaborating to discover the secrets of second languages. Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining me today. I would like to start this talk by acknowledging that to give a last lecture when one could easily have 30 years of a career ahead of oneself is a challenge. However, this has been a great opportunity to think about what I would like to share with others about what I have learned in my years of experience as a college professor and mentor, both in the classroom and in my research lab. Michigan's number one professor for the year, so you should be very... Oh my goodness. I realized that I'm the first Golden Apple recipient, both to receive news of the award via Zoom and also deliver their last lecture online. For this reason, I have taken advantage of the technology available to prepare a different type of talk that I hope you will enjoy wherever you are. I think that you already have an idea of the style that I'm trying to adopt in this talk. I want to start by thanking Emily McCann, Kyle Ribock, and everyone else on the Golden Apple Award Committee for organizing this wonderful event. I can promise that for as long as I live, I will never forget the day I heard the news. I'm thrilled to receive this Golden Apple Award this year, and I also want to thank all my students, past and present, for giving me the opportunity to perform a job that I love and for allowing me to become part of their lives. I also want to thank my colleagues in Romance Languages and Literatures for the inspiring work that they all do. I wouldn't be here today without all the support and guidance that I received from all of you, staff, faculty, and grad students. Without your support, I wouldn't have been able to teach, run studies, do advising, participate in committees, or publish my research. Our job is a constant and systematic collaboration, and it is a pleasure to work with all of you. In these times, I miss all of you terribly, and I can't wait to celebrate this award when we can meet again safely. And for now, I would also like to thank the members of our Psycholinguistics Reading Group, organized through the Department of Psychology, for all the amazing feedback that you have given me all these years. You're a terrific crowd, and I truly enjoy our meetings. So let's get started. So how to start one's last lecture? While I was preparing this talk, I was thinking a lot about the many facets of this profession and how rewarding it is. Needless to say, there is a great deal of sacrifice, but my hope is that by the end of this talk, if you're thinking about becoming a teacher yourself, that you see what an awesome profession this is, how much you can learn and experience, and above all, how many lives you can impact and hopefully make better. While the main focus of this talk will center around words you didn't know, whether they're overlooked, new, or simply unknown to us personally, it will be incorporated into larger stories of mentorship, teaching, and collaboration. Let's start with the story of the Golden Apple Award. The origin is not very clear, but it has been said that children would give an apple to their teachers during the first day of class in September, which also corresponds to harvest time. It appears that this tradition started in Scandinavia in the 19th century and it expanded in the US during the Great Depression in the 1930s. Bringing other fruits and vegetables to the teacher seemed also a rather good idea to provide a gift from the harvest or even as an acceptable payment in kind from parents that were unable to afford the fees to pay for their children's education. When I first heard from the Golden Apple Committee, I was both thrilled and humbled. Over the years, I have been fortunate to meet other professors who have helped me to be better at my job as a teacher, researcher, and mentor, and I would like to say thank you. Of course, there were others, and their influence sparked something in me. When I began my teaching career, my mission became to pass on this legacy of mentorship to my students. Connecting with students and helping them achieve their goals is the best part of my job. However, I sometimes wonder if I'm actually making a difference, or if my courses are viewed as three more credits on the way to fulfilling the requirements of a degree. For me, this award is a confirmation that I'm having a positive impact on their lives, and for that I am extremely grateful. Let's move on to the most practical side of this talk. This part may be useful to those interested in pursuing a career in teaching. By the end of his life, Leo Vygotsky introduced the idea that when a child engages in dialogue with someone more knowledgeable, they develop the ability to solve problems independently and realize certain tasks without help. Since then, this theoretical concept has been widely interpreted by educators such that there is only so much that we can do without help and much more that we can do with help. This notion has become one of the pillars of my own teaching philosophy, 
in which I try to utilize my expertise and way of thinking to inspire my students and help them achieve their goals. Like many of you, I strive to create a safe, engaging learning environment, incorporating a mix of PowerPoints, online tutorials, questionnaires, reading, discussion, and classroom participation activities as a way to involve students directly in the learning process. But perhaps what I work the hardest on is making sure that everyone is present in the here and now. In my experience, students tend to engage best when they are aware that their teaching is subordinated to their learning process. This idea was put forward by Caleb Cateño, and I learned about him in Professor Diane Larson Freeman's class, a course that I attended during my first semester working here at Michigan. With no exaggeration, my attending her course has impacted my teaching the most. All of us, instructors and students, know how challenging it is to be present in any given class, and it is even harder in this new remote teaching environment. However, together we can do it. I believe, though, that the responsibility for this cannot only fall on the instructor, as everyone involved needs to make an additional effort to guarantee success. Let me offer a few examples. How do I subordinate my teaching to the learning process of my students? Well, let me offer you some context. I was raised originally in Spain, and there, finishing the course syllabus was, and still is, the most important thing. With the standardized exams at the end of the high school years to attend college, I remember dreading the last few weeks of every term, where almost every day we would start a new topic with the hopes of catching up. I'm sure that many of you in the audience have experienced something similar. I think it's best to learn some things really well instead of speeding through many topics. Of course, the concern is time, but with the emergence of technology in the classroom, I believe that students do not need to spend too much time taking notes. Since I teach my classes in Spanish, which is the second language for most of my students, I think it's much more beneficial to interact with other classmates during group activities and engage with presentations and discussions. This way, my students can spend the entire session actively processing and engaging with the new information. And believe me, having students talk through whatever you're discussing during class time is not a waste of time. It's important to keep in mind that if it doesn't take place in the class, it may actually never happen outside of class. As for being present, I'm going to present a very straightforward activity for which, as a student, you have to be 100% engaged. Otherwise, the activity won't be successful and learning will not happen. The benefit about this activity is that you can use it in an in-person or remote environment. The first one is a very simple task that all of you can use independently of the subject matter or how many students are enrolled in the class. I call it the A and B partner activity because students are paired to review a specific terminology related to linguistics. This is how it works. While student A looks at the screen or projector, student B looks away. Student A sees information that has to be described to student B, and then student B needs to come up with an answer that resembles as close as possible what appears on the screen. Once this first goal is met, the pair changes roles. A becomes B, and B becomes A. This technique can be used to review and practice pretty much any type of information. Another option is to use this technique to teach phonetics or specific aspects of pronunciation. For example, these are phonetic symbols that student A has to describe to student B. Student A has to provide the articulatory description. And student B has to listen to the description and then produce the sound. And then the partners change roles. This is what is known as task-based language teaching. My students love this game, and I find that it helps them review critical concepts in the course, practice their Spanish skills, and create community around the learning process. You may be wondering, okay, but what about more advanced courses? In Spanish for 18, a 400-level course on second language acquisition tailored to juniors and seniors who have already taken other courses in linguistics, I use a research activity where my students throughout the semester can investigate their peers' experiences during a study abroad program. This research activity consists of first transcribing their peers' oral speech and learning from their experiences abroad. Second, following online tutorials to learn how to analyze speech acoustically. Third, applying this new knowledge to the speech of students who have already studied abroad and theorizing about their development. Fourth, 
presenting progress reports throughout the semester in teams. And finally, writing a paper discussing what they would do differently in their own study abroad experience. I believe that this activity is particularly useful when you're learning a second language, as it offers insights into the degree to which second language learners can benefit from a study abroad experience. Although not everyone in the audience here is a linguist, I do think that this type of activity that allows our students to analyze their peers performing a similar activity can be extremely eye-opening. We could extrapolate this to a prospective interview at a graduate program or a big tech company. Incorporating these authentic experiences in our classes may be challenging the first time, but students themselves have a great sense of how to integrate feedback into their professional lives. So feel free to ask them. Now, since we were talking about study abroad, do you remember once upon a time when study abroad was one of the most looked forward to opportunities for students? Well, although I was looking for a moment of levity here, I have to say that although right now it's not on many students' radars, I am confident that there will be a time when these opportunities will be available for students again. In the meantime, I'm very sympathetic towards students that were not able to travel abroad or whose study abroad programs were canceled during the pandemic. And I really wish that things could have been different for you. Okay, let's change gears and talk about what new teaching aids I have been developing to help my students. The latest teaching innovation that I have been developing is an online resource for teaching Spanish pronunciation. In our linguistic courses, it's very important to develop a thorough knowledge of Spanish pronunciation. In order to facilitate this learning, we have created this online resource so that students can understand how to produce some of the harder sounds in their second language. Here, you see a chart that shows different phonetic symbols in Spanish, and by clicking on each symbol, we see a side view of the mouth illustrating how the sounds are produced. This is what we've come up with so far, so feel free to use it to improve your Spanish pronunciation. Before moving on, I have a few recommendations for future instructors. If you're interested in this profession, I would encourage you to take a step back and pay close attention to your current instructors. Keep a diary of what you think are useful techniques and activities that make a complex topic something easy to understand and learn. Also, to our future teachers, don't be afraid to push your students, always within reason, of course. For example, my classes are by no means a walk in the clouds. On the contrary, students often rate them as having a relatively heavier workload than most others they take. Still, I believe they enjoy them. Before the pandemic, one of our major priorities was to take care of the mental balance of our students. And the current health crisis has only underscored the importance of accepting our vulnerabilities as human beings. A place where we strive to do that is the Speech Production Lab, also known as the SBL. My colleague Nick Hendrickson and I envisioned the Speech Production Lab back in 2015. The underlying philosophy was to transform the lab from a single input environment to one where everyone, including myself, is encouraged to teach, be mentored, and become a mentor. It's not always easy. Collaboration is an exercise in compromise, patience, communication, and resilience. However, I found that the work accomplished with collaboration is many times more diverse, productive, and creative than what I could have done on my own. Pre-COVID, Nick and I would host a weekly in-person meeting with our ACE to discuss the research process. Although I make sure to connect with my students in the classroom, most of my mentoring actually occurs in this research environment. Similar to many other disciplines, this lab gives undergraduates the opportunity to become directly involved in research while developing a sense of community. This, combined with the fact that student-led research and mentoring are such a large focus in our lab, means that we try to keep the doors as open as possible to bring in new talent. Our students all have different origin stories for how they came to work in the lab. Many undergraduate students find us through Europe, introduction to linguistics courses, and independent study and upper level courses. The last route is through word of mouth, where new students are brought in by friends who work in the lab. I'm really happy whenever this happens, as it shows that our students enjoy working here and want their friends to be able to experience our collaborative environment as well. Just so that you can get a sense of what we do, here you can see some of the research areas that we're working on. 
Right now, we're working on Andalusian Spanish, African Spanish bilingualism in Patagonia, Spanish prosody, second language fluency and study abroad, second language psycholinguistics, second language captioning, and also on our public scholarship. There is a big connection between the research that we do in our lab and the courses that we offer. We're very fortunate to have great colleagues in Romance, Languages and Literatures who teach alongside us. Here you can see some of the offerings for winter 2021. Students mentoring our lab use the tools they acquired to better themselves and further their careers. Fulbright scholars, Peace Corps volunteers, linguistic PhDs, Amazon programmers, and Apple engineers have gotten their start in the speech production lab. Even students whose major is outside of the humanities have told us about the valuable life skills they picked up in the lab that had enabled them to be successful in their fields. Of course, we're not taking credit for the hard work, but I view the lab as a place where students are encouraged to grow and hone their skills in a way that helps them achieve their personal goals later in life. And many of them have published with us. For example, with Sean Lang, we investigated the production of field pauses, such as am and a in Afrikaans, and m and e in Spanish, in a bilingual community which I will describe to you shortly. With Mirna Sintron, we investigated the effects of captioning or learning grammar and vocabulary in Spanish as a second language in an instructional setting. What you see on the screen is a short clip of one of the caption videos that we created together. Later, you'll have a chance to see a few more. However, we're not only publishing in established journals. We also want to reach out to the public and make our research accessible to a broad readership. Here is a publication with Ian Cook in Inside Higher Ed. Our collaborator, Ryan Speech, spearheaded a different collaborative article published in 2018 in The Conversation. Our colleagues, Paulina Alberto and Ana Silva, were the primary authors of this article entitled The Other Afro-Argentines. Don't take it from me, but with all this writing happening around our research assistants, they ended up publishing on their own. And here we have an article by Ellie Johandes about women in STEM. As you have seen, collaboration is very important for me. In fact, I view collaboration between students and faculty as the most valuable outcome of what we do in the lab. These days, our meetings are still happening virtually. In fact, since our meetings now take place on Fridays, guess where we should be right now? In a lab meeting, of course. However, last week, Nick and I agreed that we wanted to make sure that all lab members could be here to celebrate with us. So I guess we'll see everyone next Friday, 2.30 to 5 on Zoom, right? Jokes aside, our undergraduate students are with us every step of the way. From data collection to data processing, collaborating in collective writing, and in some cases, publishing. Some of them have enjoyed the opportunity to develop additional leadership skills as lab managers. So a special mention in chronological order to Sara Wadfarid, Libby Garno, and Ella Ditton, for their exemplary leadership since 2015. And now seems like a good opportunity to hear what some students have to say about their experiences in the SBL. Typically, if you're just joining the lab, you'll join a team in progress on one of Nick or Lorenzo's most recent research endeavors and get assigned to a role where your personal expertise can be put to use. No one of us has the same skill set, so there's always a unique role for each of us to contribute at a given time. As you spend more time in the lab, you begin to learn about other existing projects, and you may be able to help out with more than one, either by expressing interest directly or being assigned. Some projects are more directly student-driven, which has been a part of my experience, as with the help of other RAs and faculty, I developed an ongoing lab project into an honors thesis. In the SPL, we're also very open to feedback and dialogue, and so there's always an option to offer new ideas, such as how to make work more efficient or designs more appealing. It's hard to find such an overall positive and productive community, and I'm so thankful that I've had a chance to be a part of it. What keeps me coming back to the lab and so many other undergraduates is that it's the most supportive environment I've ever found for research, especially undergraduate research. Working in the lab means a lot to me because I'm really interested in a lot of the issues that the, the lab studies through linguistics. And by being involved as an editor, I get to be involved in every project at once. And I really feel like I have my finger on the pulse of what's going on in the linguistic research community. 
Working in the lab also made me realize how much I love linguistics and the research process and was very influential in my decision to attend graduate school and to pursue my PhD in linguistics. The lab has a big focus on collaboration, which I really like. We get to meet a bunch of other research assistants and work with them at the lab meetings. We'll um, work with our project teams and bounce ideas off each other and learn from each other. And I have friends who are in other labs and they just do what they're assigned to do alone. And then they're surprised that I have friends in my lab and that we work together. And it's, um, it's been one of my favorite parts of the lab. Lorenzo and Nick have become personal mentors to me, and the other research assistants have become friends who are easy to be around, hardworking collaborators, and people whom I look forward to seeing in our meetings at the end of a long week. Well, thank you so much to my students for those very nice words. As much as I love talking about the lab, I would like to return now to the title of the talk. So what did I mean by words that you didn't know? Without words, there is no way to communicate ideas between speakers. Today, I want to teach you about words that you might not know. These words can include everything from small utterances that we usually don't think of as words, to the creation of new words due to the pressures of advancing technology, to simply unknown vocabulary words. Hesitation phenomena, as the name implies, are hesitations in our speech. Examples of this are field pauses such as the us and uns that are usually associated with a nervous second language speaker. Even though they lack lexical meaning, um, uh, or er, are surprisingly common. In fact, they make up six to 10% of our everyday speech. The most amazing characteristic about field pauses is their ubiquity, and every language uses them. The ones that you see on the screen come from Spanish. So uh, call me like, Come over. And um, just let me know. Uh, okay, sounds good. Field pauses also give us a glimpse into how our brains are processing language. Whenever we're struggling to find a rarely used word or formulate a complex thought, these linguistic particles are used to buy us time while our brain searches for the correct terms. The type of field pause also gives us a preview into what sort of structure we're constructing. In English, a uh, is typically indicative of shorter phrases, while um signals a longer, more complex utterance. For linguists studying second language acquisition, field pauses are a gold mine for understanding how the brain adapts to the introduction of a new language. Typically, a second language learner will use the field pauses from the first language as they begin to learn the second. This reflects how first and second languages are usually represented as two distinct categories in the brains of late second language learners. As they become more fluent, their field pauses will slowly morph to reflect the hesitations of the second language, a sign of a slight overlap or merge between their brain's language categories as the two are used more often. A variety of factors can influence how much this shift occurs, including time speaking, level of fluency, amount of second language use, and surrounding environment, all factors that we examine in our lab. We studied this phenomenon in a small community in Patagonia, who are bilingual in both Spanish and Afrikaans. But before we talk about the experiment and our findings, I want to tell you a couple of things. The first is that this project originated as many do, over a friendly meal. Our colleague Andres Kutsia, a theoretical and laboratory phonologist, was describing the Patagonian board community to Nick Hendrickson and me, who, as you already know, specialize in Spanish. Having grown up in South Africa, surrounded by legends of a group of Boers who had maintained their language and culture in Argentina, Andres was eager to document this community and see how their Afrikaans had changed or failed to change over time. However, with many of the modern-day community members speaking Spanish, he was having difficulty achieving contact. Nick and I found ourselves compelled by the Patagonian Boers' story and realized that with Andres, we would make the perfect team to research this community. Nick and I could contact community members and arrange meetings in Spanish, while Andres could assess their skills in Afrikaans. And this is how the From Africa to Patagonia Voices of Displacement project was born. The second point that I'd like to make is that working on the From Africa to Patagonia 
Voices of Displacement project has been an amazing and truly rewarding academic experience. Every name that you see on the screen represents one of the nearly 50 collaborators that we have worked with since 2016. To all involved, my heartfelt thank you for all that you have contributed to our team. I also want to thank the Office of the Provost for providing the necessary resources to launch the Humanities Collaboratory Initiative. I also want to thank the wonderful team of people working on this endeavor. Special thanks go to Peggy McCracken, Kristen Haas, Sherry Sitsema Geiger, and Audrey Becker for all their help and support since 2016. Without your help, this collaborative network wouldn't have been possible. And now, coming back to our research project, I would like to show you a video that explains why this community that we research is so special. In Argentina, there is a group of people that has been speaking a unique variety of Afrikaans for more than a century after their ancestors emigrated. They are the Patagonian Boers, now four generations removed from their original South African ancestors. Although the newest generation mostly speaks Spanish, their parents, the grandchildren of the original settlers, still speak Afrikaans. To see why their language story is enticing to linguists, we need to look at linguist Joshua Fishman's three-generational model of language loss. Fishman proposed that when people migrate, the first settlers primarily speak their home country's language, then the second generation is typically bilingual. The members of this generation use both their ancestral language as well as the majority language in the community. However, in this community, the third generation of Boers is very fluent in their ancestral Afrikaans. So, what were the historical and social conditions that led to the Boers to be such an exception to linguistic law? Afrikaans can be traced back to a small group of Dutch settlers who came to South Africa in the mid-17th century. Over time, their Dutch evolved into Cape Dutch, which contained elements of languages indigenous to southern Africa, including Khoikhoi and Nguni languages, other European languages such as French and Portuguese, as well as Asian languages such as Malay. Its speakers were fiercely proud of Afrikaans, even though it was not officially recognized as a language until 1925. At the end of the 19th century, the Argentinian government was trying to make Argentina more white. They cleared the Patagonian region of its native peoples and offered free land to the Boers, who were unwilling to live under British rule after the end of the Anglo-Boer War in 1902. The first Boers departed from Cape Town aboard La Pampa in April 1902, drawn by the Argentinian government's promise of land and freedom. Once in Argentina, they founded an isolated settlement based on farming and livestock known as Colonia Escalante. In addition to geographical separation, the Boers also saw the Catholicism of their Argentine neighbors as a challenge to their Dutch Reformed values. Schools and churches were built in an effort to maintain the community, and so the Boers remained socially isolated from the Spanish language. This all changed with the advent of the oil industry in Comodoro Rivadavia after World War I, as well as urban development in the 1950s that led to movement from the countryside to the city. Boer children were now educated in Spanish schools, and Spanish slowly became the de facto social language. As a result, Argentinian Boer culture is now a mixture of Afrikaans and Argentinian traditions. Adults talk in a mix of Afrikaans and Spanish while drinking mate, while their children speak excitedly in Spanish about the upcoming Boer sports festival. Their Afrikaans too has adapted. Words have been created to describe how the world has changed since the original settlers came in 1902, such as Luchskop, literally airship, or Luchskopstasi, airship station, to describe airplane and airport, 
terms different than those used by Afrikaans speakers in South Africa. As integral as their heritage is to the Boers, they have been unable to escape the push towards integration. The third generation speakers are becoming older, while their children and grandchildren speak only Spanish. However, recent interest in the linguistic and social properties of the community, such as The Boers at the End of the World, a film by Richard Gregory, and the University of Michigan From Africa to Patagonia, Voices of Displacement project, has led to an Afrikaans renaissance within the area. Community members are working to preserve their heritage from dedicating a Boer museum to refreshing their Afrikaans skills with online courses. As such, this unique community is poised to protect their culture for decades to come. All right, wasn't that very cool? I hope that this video helps to contextualize our research. As I mentioned earlier, we studied the production of field pauses in the Afrikaans Spanish bilinguals, and now I'm going to discuss the results of our study. Even though the first language of our bilinguals was Afrikaans, they speak Spanish a majority of the time. We interviewed the bilinguals in both languages in order to compare their field pauses in Spanish with those of Spanish controlled speakers from Argentina, who typically produce a uh, M. Then we also compared the bilinguals field pauses in Afrikaans with those of Afrikaans controlled speakers from South Africa, who typically produce uh, an um. We found that the Patagonian Boers produced field pauses that were different from either Afrikaans or Spanish field pauses, but also intermediate between them. In other words, they were a blended category of field pauses, a byproduct of decades of speaking both languages. As you can see in the graph, on the y-axis, we are measuring the first frequency, F1, which gives you information about vowel height, that is, the position of your tongue within the mouth. Higher values on this scale indicate lower vowels, such as schwa, and lower values on this scale indicate higher vowels, such as e. Next, on the x-axis, we have the four participant groups. African speakers from South Africa, Spanish speakers from Argentina, and the bilinguals in both Afrikaans and Spanish. As we can see here, the Afrikaans controls who live in South Africa are at one extreme. The Spanish controls who live in Argentina are at another extreme. And the bilinguals are in between both groups in each of their languages. This led to the theory that the same category that the bilingual speakers' brains applied to vowels were also being applied to field pauses as well. We called it our merged vowels in field pauses theory. The important takeaway from the study is that the pattern that bilinguals are producing in field pauses are the same that are documented for real words in bilingual speech. In other words, the bilinguals are treating the vowels in field pauses as they're treating the vowels of real words. I would like to encourage you to consider that in many respects, human beings use field pauses linguistically like real words. Perhaps this takeaway can persuade you to think of this as the first example of the words that you didn't know. These findings were published this year in a paper entitled Field pauses are susceptible to cross-language phonetic influence, evidence from Afrikaans Spanish bilingual. The changes that our speech undergoes as we learn a second language are at the heart of the Speech Production Labs research. We typically collect data from students at Michigan as they participate in Spanish study abroad programs. As you can see in this animation, the pandemic had brought our data collection to a halt. However, there is opportunity to continue to analyze the data from previous years, which, to be perfectly honest, makes me feel a little bit like an archaeologist. For example, We've studied how the study abroad environment affects the amount of language spoken in connection to oral proficiency development. We have also designed new methods of tracking language use for learners who want to go abroad in the future. My newest instrument, known as the Daily Language Questionnaire, is an online tool specifically designed to be accessible to students and reflective of their time abroad. Using these questionnaires, we can better understand where and how students are using their second language the most 
in order to develop a more effective learning environment in their home countries. The paper that you see on the screen was from our first version, and since then we have been working on improving this instrument. This graph comes from an in-progress research project that is a follow-up to our first DLQ publication. We ran this study with one group of Spanish learners studying abroad in Spain. Like many study abroad programs, there was no institutionalized language pledge, and although students were reminded on site to speak in Spanish as much as possible, it was their prerogative whether they wanted to speak in Spanish or English. Regarding the graph that you can see on the screen, on the y-axis we see total percent of Spanish, and on the x-axis, weak. We can see that Spanish use is higher for class days, that is days where learners had scheduled classes to attend, than no class days from week one, and also that the use of Spanish shows a chronological decline over the course of the program. Okay, I don't want to worry you too much about this 16 and 17% of Spanish use on weeks five and six respectively, because this is typically much more Spanish engagement than what learners are used to when they are in the United States. The question is, how much language use is necessary to improve one's level of proficiency? One thing I can say is that the picture is complex because related to language use is the level of proficiency at the beginning of the study abroad experience, the willingness to speak, the intensity of interactions, and the development of social networks in the study abroad context. All of these aspects are related and we will certainly take them into account in our future research. By displaying a chronological decline over time of Spanish use, these learners were using less words in Spanish, which contributed to an overall lack of significant effect of time on their Spanish proficiency. A note of hope is that I have also investigated intensive overseas immersion programs with a well-established language pledge. And learners use Spanish substantially more, which in turn contributes to significant proficiency development. However, a word of caution, any sort of institutionalized commitment to adhere to rules, such as a language pledge in a study abroad context, is a big endeavor as a certain culture needs to be developed at the home institution. In January 2021, a new paper of mine on measuring language use in an overseas immersion context with a rigorous language pledge will see the light. I am hopeful that it will contribute to a much needed conversation regarding how to make our study abroad programs more effective for our students interested in learning languages abroad. Moving on to the last study. I think that together and in collaboration, we can use our research endeavors to facilitate the best learning environment for our students. This was how Mirna Sintron Valentin, a then grad student in psychology, and now a recently promoted research data specialist at the Justice Department in California, and I initiated a collaboration to investigate the effect of captioning on the acquisition of vocabulary and grammar. The development of the captioning study was a multi-year endeavor examining how the incorporation of captions into language learning videos affects the acquisition of both vocabulary and grammar structures. On the screen, you can see an example of the first video we designed targeting the difference between the preterite and the imperfect, as well as new vocabulary. In fact, this study represents the final example of words you didn't know in today's talk. In this case, these were words that we guaranteed that our learners could not know prior to participating in the study. We used obscure Spanish vocabulary words from a familiar dialects. For example, the noun for sandwich in Spanish, el bocadillo, for just sandwich, was replaced by a much lesser known version, el emparedado, that you probably just saw highlighted in yellow. In this other movie, we were targeting the gustar type of verbs as well as new vocabulary. One of these new words was the adjective dishonest, which in Spanish can be translated typically as desvergonzado or deshonesto. We decided to replace this form with a lesser frequent form impudico, that you can see highlighted in yellow in the captioning line. By providing students with words that were almost guaranteed to be unfamiliar to them, we could then test the effects of including these unfamiliar words in videos with and without enhanced captions. We found that enhanced captioning increased both recognition, interpreted as the ability to recall that a word had been used, and production, 
which we interpreted as the ability to give the words meaning. The following graph illustrates the effects of our captioning research. On the y-axis, you have accuracy from 0 to 100%, and on the x-axis, you have our four experimental conditions. Number one is our control group, where learners only watched videos with no captions included. Number two is lesson plus vocabulary caption, where learners watched a lesson focused on a grammatical point and afterwards watched a captioned video, where the captions included vocabulary enhancement. Number three is lesson plus grammar caption, where learners watched a lesson of a grammatical point and afterwards watched a captioned video, where the captions included grammar enhancement. And finally, number four is no lesson plus grammar caption, where learners were not provided with a grammar lesson, but only with a captioned video, where the captions included grammar enhancement. As you can see, in terms of accuracy, which was measured in terms of word recognition, the control group is barely above 50%, which is barely above chance. However, the other three experimental conditions led to gains in accuracy, with the second one, lesson plus vocabulary caption, showing a significant difference when compared with lesson plus grammar caption and no lesson plus grammar caption. The work that we're doing in the speech production lab is leading to a better understanding of how language changes throughout the learning process, as well as the development of more efficient techniques to teach second languages. Okay, this concludes the research portion of our talk. But before we conclude, I think it would be useful to walk through a summary of some of the words that you might not have known prior to attending today's talk. Okay, let's list them out. First, today we have learned about the SPL, which now you know stands for Speech Production Lab. Second, you learn that in Patagonian Afrikaans, Luxcoop means airplane. Third, you also learned that in Patagonian Afrikaans, Luxcoop Stasi means airport. Next, you learned that field pauses, such as a uh and um, are considered words by some psychologists and linguists, and also that our research has shown that bilinguals do apply similar processes to the vowels in field pauses and the vowels in meaningful lexical words. Next, you have learned that DLQ stands for Daily Language Questionnaire, and that is a tool that we have created to keep fine-tuning our understanding of language use by study abroad learners, as well as its critical theoretical relationship with second language oral proficiency development. Finally, you have learned that in Spanish, emparedado means sandwich, and that impudico means dishonest. You also saw that in carefully controlled experimental videos, caption enhancement can be very useful to acquire vocabulary in second language Spanish. If this were truly my last lecture, I would end it, as I have with many papers in the past, with a recommendation for the future. There is no denying that the times we currently live in are tumultuous. This past year, we have experienced natural disasters, racial injustice, and a global pandemic. Closer to home, one matter that is socially important for me is the overabundance of hostile architecture designed to make being homeless even more challenging. These problems are large and almost impossible to combat as individuals. However, here in the United States, we have a right by which we can make our collective desires known, voting. Undergraduates in my lab are extremely passionate about this topic. They have started a movement to encourage both other lab members and their peers to vote in the upcoming election. Please take their example and spread the word to not only exert your right to vote, but also encourage and help those that may feel incapable or intimidated to do so to also exert their right. Remember that the sky is the limit. Last thing that I'll say is that I hope to be here again next year to see who receives this very special and meaningful Golden Apple Award. Thank you so much and make sure to join us after this talk for questions through the Zoom webinar. I'm looking forward to them.